Right, thank you everyone to uh, come back to the uh, final sessions of day one. So as I would like to say that for myself personally, I think it, uh, we have had a really, really good day with all the interesting talks and sharings and discussions uh, from the keynote speakers or the other in, uh, speakers, as well as in the discussions. Um, we can see that we can actually continue discussing all of these debates about public spending services and productions uh, for throughout the four days and let's keep all of the comments coming. Um, so for these sessions, we would like to dedicate it uh, to all the partners that actually make it happen. You can actually see that the program is so full of interesting talks and we wouldn't have this interesting program in this full four days program without the contribution um, and also the support, uh, the dedication in terms of you know, all the brain power we get from all of our, our, um, our partners as well as you know, it's not just uh, their heart and soul into it as well. Um, in these uh, in, in this sections, in these sessions, we would like to um, each, each partner um, in this conference to share why they think that the narratives in public uh, spending services and productions matter, why we need to rethink what's happening to the current narratives, what we can change and why they decided to partner um, in this conference. As you know, and I think from the very beginning, you also see that this is a really unconventional conference because this is one of the kind and very unusual collaborations between education institutions, academic researchers, trade unions, social movements, NGOs, all of uh, different uh, partners in this conference make it so unique that we do not just hear from one side of the story, uh, from just evidence, from just observations, but also from the people who work in the ground in interactions, uh, direct daily interactions with the people um, related to public services and public spending. So from my side, as I just want to reiterate, I'm a research fellow in mission-oriented innovation at UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Um, so UCL is pleased to host this conference um, along with University of Greenwich, uh, University of Ghana, CONICET, as in Premsey universities, as well as other partners like Public Services International, Transnational Institute, ITF, Oxfam, um, the Young Scholar Initiative from INET. And we really appreciate the support and, uh, and donations from the Open Society Foundation. And we would like to hear each of you, uh, the representatives from different partners to share uh, your thoughts so from IPP, we uh, actually we are we were set up about five years ago, and uh, we still a young institute. However, loads of the research done by IPP, led by Professor Mariana Mazzucato, um, is not new. It's a revival of what we actually need to do and to rethink how we can build the public service, uh, sorry, public sector capacity, rethink about the new narratives embraced by the governments around the world. And we are trying to tackle the, those challenges by looking at the um, new forms of investments, of regulations, of collaborations. We're trying to do that because I think that the world and all the governments around the world are trying to, uh, are also facing altogether uh, pressing challenges like social, technological, economics, and especially global warming. And we need to do that by connecting not just academics, but also policymakers um, in this um, discussion in this network as well. So that is why part of my work is uh, trying to uh, gather the government agencies in the US in particular, but also government agencies around the world to discuss, not, not just to discuss what they are doing, to actually pose the questions, their challenges, their daily challenges, their grand challenges, and also to share uh, among themselves what they have done successfully and what they have not. 
Um, and I believe that the lessons that we learn from the, the conference will be able to be shared across our networks of government agencies and academics, because it was very important for us to know what works, uh, to actually think, rethink that government policy, when it's done properly, it would actually bring amazing results. So I hope that um, this is going to be the first of the many, many years that we can actually be able to do this, to gather together and uh, to discuss these uh, pressing issues. So now I would like to pass on to Dr. Vera Veyman from the University of Greenwich. Uh, and University of Greenwich, we are really grateful for the, uh, to, for, for, for CIRUS within uh, University of Greenwich to be our core organizer of this conference. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, yeah, I can just only echo what Jenny just said. It's it's to be part of this online conference and in a way that even that it allows us to really come across um with like the, come together with people across the globe. And so yeah, just quickly quickly, I want to introduce myself. So I'm Vera Wigman, I'm at Cyru um, Greenwich University. And um, the session is also that we almost like an introduction all know each other. So I guess most of you already know um, uh, what Cyro has been doing, you don't. So we have done uh, research on public services and, and for over 20 years. It was originally set up by Dave Hall, who is obviously here today, <laughs> and uh, the major head behind this. Uh, and also the major hat behind uh, Psyru, and we have um, been doing this. So we looked um, at public sector reforms, uh, but also how to uh, finance uh, the public services and the pitfalls of privatization in, in its many forms. We're really looking critically at, at uh, public-private partnerships, for example. And then how to reverse it, um, how to reverse privatization and nationalization or remunicipalization. And we have this type of uh, research um, with um, like looking at various sectors um, from water and sanitation to energy to waste management to health services um, and so on. Uh, we have also always, and that's why we are so excited about this conference, done this in collaboration with trade unions and civil society organizations. Um, and the whole idea behind that is to share knowledge about different str struggles, to share knowledge about um, how good quality public services um, can look like, um, that they're not only um, of good quality in terms of the service, but also environmentally friendly and provide decent working conditions um, for the people who provide these services in the first place. Um, so we have done this through academic articles, but also um, in the same time, um, more reports and even toolkits. So for example, let's take the issue of remunicipalization. We have written about this for the last 10 years, um, yes, in academic journals, but also um, produced uh, toolkits for trade unionists and a, a study um, we did for PSI where we looked at uh, 50 different um, countries and um, or 50 different cases of remunicipalization across the world really and across sectors and also um, toolkits for um, uh, local politicians on, on remunicipalization so that's a, def a separate toolkit we did. So um, all of this um, really matters in terms of producing um, research which actually has a base in action and vice versa so that um, our campaigns hopefully become more empowered by good research um, but in the same time also um, has a foundation um, and vice versa that our research is um, influenced by action and actually a research which is a applicable and can be used. So um, I just really quickly want to say like why um, I'm so excited about the themes of the conference, because when we talk about public services and, and the narratives around it, there are so many questions and already the debate was so lovely today and I really liked how many more questions came to the fore. One fundamental question, well, I want to raise three, but one is um, 
who is actually benefiting for these services and who has access to these services. And um, well, we have already discussed that this is not, not um, always equal, not everybody has access to it. We should also remember that many people of, uh, across the world either don't have access or, or have, have access to info, uh, service provided through the informal sector. And often these are more pricey and um, lack of quality. So the question of how do we ensure that everybody has universal access is, is really key. Um, and this often goes together with um, uh, the infrastructure around it and really nation building capacity. So one theme of this conference has been to look um, at nation building and capacity building for public services. So that's one theme we address tomorrow. And I hope some of you come back um, to these workshops. Mm, but then it's also um, about much more than that, because if we um, we cannot end just with, you know, a good public service because the public service or the remunicipalization um, or pub public ownership is not, it's not the end. It's only the beginning, the beginning to how do we want to run good public services? How do we make that um, they're democratically sound, that, they're pe that people can participate in the running of these services and that they reach everybody? So again, um, Democracy is another key theme of this conference, um, and we will uh, further tomorrow. And lastly, of course, a public service is only as good if, as it's funded. So if we don't invest in our public services, we don't have anything to do with. So um, it's really key that we think about the financing of public service. We already had some really brilliant um, ideas today from Isabel Ortiz um, talking about different ways of um, taxation and how to uh, make we have the money to run these services. So that's another theme we will look at tomorrow. Yeah, lots of exciting topics to explore. Um, and um, again, just to say that this conference is about networking and bringing together academics and activists. So we really hope that you use this virtual space to get to know the don't know yet, ask all questions, don't be shy. I mean, it's a bit weird talking to to a computer and not meeting in person, but on the other hand, uh, it, you know, we are meet uh, with so many people from across the globe um, uh, also because of this, this virtual domain. So please just um, exchange thoughts and see that this, this conference could be a starting point, like Jenny said, for further conferences, but also collaboration on research projects um, bringing bringing different people together, different academics and different activists. I stop here and um, we pass on, right? Jenny, do you want to pass on speaker? Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Vera. And um, so now I would like to uh, go to the next part. It was all very important in shaping the sessions that you will join uh, to, uh, in day two and day three, especially we look, when we're looking at um, um, Africa, so what's happening in Africa. So we would like to invite Professor uh, Nana Akwa Ayidoho from the Institute for um, the Institutes of African Studies. And uh, so the Institutes of African Studies is a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary institute with a mandate to conduct research into all aspects of the arts and the social sciences in Africa. So we are really um, honored to have uh, Professor Nana to um, present her thoughts. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, yes, so my name is Nana Ikuya Anyudoho, and I'm a researcher at, of social policy at the University of Ghana, which is um, our oldest and largest public university uh, with research centers like the Institute of Afghan Studies. I'm actually the director of a different research center, which is the Center for Social Policy Studies. But more to the point of this conference, I'm a co PI of a research project that is based at the Institute of African Studies. So we do try to collaborate. And that, um, as you mentioned, the Institute of African Studies was set up to do research that would underpin African-centered social and economic development. Um, 
the research project itself is called the Gender and Equitable Social Policy for Post-COVID Africa Project, the GESPA project. It's funded by Open Society and it brings together researchers from 27 countries all over the continent. And the main aim is to change the discourse and then the practice of Um, I believe that um, social policy making on the oh, okay. is Excuse about. Me. Oh well, unfortunately, I. I I'm so sorry is... that that was my internet blinked out a little bit. Can you hear me now? Okay. So um, I hope it doesn't happen again. But it's um, yes. Yeah, so I was saying that our policy making is tethered to you know neoliberal offshore governments, as a colleague of mine once described, global financial and development institutions like the World Bank and IMF. Um, so for the most part, social policy now is being conceived of and implemented in terms of social protection or sort of a very welfareist mentality. So gone are the public services that were understood in earlier areas to be part of the nation building agenda. And actually we do have a paper on that tomorrow. So I'm not going to go over that too much uh, where we do talk about how these shifts in narratives happen over time. But the point is that the GESPA project is very invested in bringing back a more expansive version or a more expansive vision of social policy. So the way we are seeking to do that is first by bringing together an interdisciplinary and intergenerational core group of researchers um, so that we can build a constituency and capacity around social policy research on the continent. But we also hope very much to draw in practitioners and, and, and policy makers uh, to have, um, if you like, a, a discursive coalition around this more expansive vision and agenda for social policy. So very much what this conference is doing, and, and that's very inspirational for us. And so being part of this, this conversation and this conference, um, it's important to us. Uh, we invited the researchers in our project to also be part of it because I think it's important to engage with like minds and just from the first day, also great minds from academia and from policy practice on this very important, very essential topic. Um, for me personally, just from the keynotes at the beginning of the day, I found it very intellectually nourishing and affirming. And what we hope for us will be a further outcome uh, beyond the learning would also be to widen further our network of communities of researchers and, and, and activists and advocates to find potential collaborators or at least readers and critiquers and users of the work that we'll be doing in the GESPA project at the University of Ghana. So thank you so much for inviting us to partner in what is shaping up to be a an interesting, fascinating, and obviously very important uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. I think uh, you you raise a really important point. It is actually where we would need to not only act, saying the things that we might kind of generally agree on, but also to question it, to discuss it, to raise, you know, criticism as well. And I think it's it's the beauty of uh, this conference that we pull in so many people from all corners of the world. So uh, hopefully we'll find uh, the best way forward. So um, the next speakers I would like to invite would be Dr. Zeko De Gupta from Azim Premzi University in India. Uh, so Azim Premzi University uh, was founded um, in 2010 with a vision to contribute to, to the realizations of a just, equitable, humane and sustainable society. That's exactly what we all hope to achieve. And uh, 
I have the honours and pleasures to work with um, a couple of academics and also to know a couple of academics from as in Premsa universities and thankful to them uh, for inputs into some of the research looking at New Delhi that uh, we got for our report. And uh, I would like to invite Dr. Zico de Gupta. Um, Zico, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Cool, uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Zico Das Gupta and I'm Assistant Professor at Azim Temji University. Um, as partner institution, we would like to welcome all of you in this exciting conference. Uh, this conference has a particular importance uh, for you know, given the kind of teaching and research activities that we do in the university. Uh, our research and teaching programs uh, have been particularly designed to contribute to policy making and development issues. Uh, in our economic courses, we offer an exposure to multiple schools of thought, and we put real-world context at the forefront. And in our research, we do the same, and we try to address issues of development from multiple perspectives, uh, from the perspective of macroeconomic theories, from the perspective of development economics. Uh, and given this, uh, this conference, uh, we are particularly excited to be a part of. And given the kind of development challenges that confront us at this juncture, the theme of PSSOP appears to be particularly relevant and like never before. And this is for a multiple reason. And the dominant narrative of globalization and neoliberalism, which once emerged during the decade of 80s, 90s, and early parts of 2000s, uh, seems to be increasingly losing its credibility after global financial crisis. And this narrative had at least two distinct elements. Uh, the first element was, of course, based on comparative advantage theories, uh, with globalization and trade liberalization was argued to make every country better off through appropriate adjustment in relative prices. Um, the economy would be predicted to operate largely at full employment, uh, as long as market forces were allowed to operate. And secondly, the role of government expenditures in the sphere of production was argued to be unnecessary at the best and price distortionary at the worst. Uh, the macroeconomic policy framework, of course, which emerged was characterized by new consensus framework and government expenditures were restricted by well-defined fiscal rule. Uh, in short, what this narrative involved was a win-win situation for everyone uh, without government expenditures. Uh, but the experience which turned out, uh, the experience that we, we had in the actual course of globalization uh, turned to be very different from all these narratives. And across the world, uh, different countries registered uh, greater joblessness, higher inequality. Uh, with austerity measures and widespread privatization, one confronts additional challenges in the sphere of health and education. Uh, the advent of global financial crisis and present pandemic has further aggravated the crisis. And all these have led to a situation where the dominant narrative has given way to alternative and contesting narratives uh, that addresses the present crisis in different ways. And that includes right populist narratives, that includes left populist narratives, and a different range of narratives which tries to address the question of inequality, the question of joblessness in their own ways. And in this context, uh, the objective of shifting narrative in favor of PSCP uh, seems to be relevant for at least two reasons. Uh, one, of course, to directly address the challenges of employment inequality or uh, quality and quantity of uh, essential services, but also to address the challenge of uh, right populist narratives uh, that claim to resolve the present crisis by pitting labor of different countries or ethnicity with one another. Um, and in this regard, it seems that uh, democratic resolution, um, an important part would be uh, shifting narrative uh, in favor of PSCP. Uh, we look forward to this uh, conference as a platform where uh, researchers and activists interact with each other, sharing their insights uh, to strengthen the initiative of constructing a new narrative. Uh, in the recent period uh, from our university, we have also organized different programs where we interact with activists uh, so that we can both share our different languages to come with some common course of action. And in this regard, we are absolutely thrilled to be a part of this conference. And we would also look forward to continue with this collaborative project in the future. 
Thanks for your time. Let's stop. Thank you, Zico. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, now I would like to um, talk about the next partner from uh, CONICET Argentina. And I would like to invite um, uh, Professor Esteban Castro. Um, I would like to say that uh, Professor Cast uh, Esteban Castro uh, was uh, a major part uh, that, who actually contribute to the report that we shared earlier in the previous session. Um, he was part of the team. And more importantly, um, he's a, uh, about his position, he's a principal investigator at the Argentina Research Institute, CONICET, an emeritus professor at Newcastle University, has established and coordinates Water Labs, a remarkable network of academics and activists working on water issues in Latin America. And we're really thankful for Prof Professor Castro to be contributing majorly to the sessions on Latin America that you will uh, be able to uh, join in uh, on day three of the conference. And you can see that Professor Castro is uh, really full uh, with all of his schedules. He's bust with energy and enthusiasm uh, and, uh, and really thankful for him to be able to come today. So I would like to uh, leave the stage to Professor Esteban Castro. Many thanks, Jenny. Uh, I am very glad to be participating. Thank you for, for your introduction. And I will say a few words about CONICET. CONICET is the National Council for Scientific and Technical Research in Argentina. It has similar institutions with similar acronyms. Eh? It's CONICET in Chile, CONACIT in Mexico, for a time where the state was playing a strong role in education and research in Latin America. So this is an institution which is public and is dedicated to research and teaching. It is a multidisciplinary, I will say, institution because it houses all the fields of knowledge. And I am in the social sciences, I am a sociologist, but I interact very closely with people from hydrology, from biology, and other disciplines that are more technical in character or more closer to the so-called hard sciences. And we interact a lot in terms of water research, for instance. But the important thing is at the core of the institution, there is a commitment from the public sector. But as the title of the conference says, the word shifting is apposite here, not just for narratives but also for practices. CONICET is a fantastic example of resistance because it survived dictatorships, military dictatorships, the aggression of neoliberal policy that tried to destroy it, and they couldn't. It still exists. It's a public institution that funds research and teaching, provides studentships, several of my students who are have a studentship from CONICET will be participating on Wednesday in the session of Latin America. And they are funded by this public institution doing research. And therefore, I think it's a fantastic example of what we are trying to do here. Of course, as he was saying in the previous session, we cannot romanticize the state or the public sector, nor narratives about this. And therefore, we have struggles. And I want to mention this, taking advantage that uh, Jenny mentioned the Water Lab Network, that I have to say it was started when I was in the UK, in Newcastle, with funding from the Liberholm Trust. And it still works. We kept it together until now, and hopefully we'll continue for many years to work together, academics, trade unionists, social movements, and others. Why I say this? because we have many criticisms because we defend the public sector. And therefore, the public sector many times is understood as the state. And as the session on Wednesday we show, particularly when we discuss the case of Chile, the state has been a terrible actor for decades in Latin America, as in other regions, as it is now in Europe as well, and the US. 
So public institutions are also at fault in many ways. We cannot identify democracy with public institution anymore, automatically at least. It's a struggle. And this is what communities are telling us. When sometimes we go and say, well, we need to promote public services here. Communities sometimes tell us, why public? We don't want that. This, this happens, for instance, in Bolivia many times. They say, we defend the common good, not the public good, which has taken out from us our own goods, like water, like essential services. So there is an enormous fight with narratives and practices. And institutions in the public sector are sometimes resistant to understand what communities are telling us. So I am very glad about this conference because it's trying to bring together the work we do as academics with the work that trade unions do, NGOs, civil society movements, and I should mention also communities that probably are not that present in our conference because we cannot bring everyone, but certainly I want to mention the communities that as the case of Colombia last week in the election show, are very active, are struggling to get a stand and to defend their rights. And I think this is the work we do. We are not perfect, we cannot cover everything, but working with communities in Latin America, and I guess in Africa and Asia is now very different, is a fundamental task ahead. Fighting narratives that exclude people and take about their rights is fundamental. But we have to listen to these communities and their claims. And I think we are doing that. And the session on Wednesday will show this. I think we will have a fantastic discussion, particularly in the case of Chile. I suggest that people who would like to listen what happened with the indigenous communities and their fight with the state and state institutions and how this is coming about, also in relation to the position of trade unions. So this is the work that we do. I am very glad about this conference and I certainly look forward to continue working together and to extend our networks of cooperation and collaboration because this is what we have to do. That is, we cannot sleep. As someone said in the previous session at the end, I think it was Dani Bertosa, we cannot just sleep on the question of the narratives because the others, especially the stream right, has its own narratives, very successful narratives, and they are coming out to fight against what we defend, which is public sector institutions, public spending, and public control and delivery of essential services. So we don't do that because of ideology, because we believe the empirical evidence shows that's the only way forward. And therefore, this conference will be a contribution towards establishing this need to continue working on, this, on these topics and persuading communities and others of the need to reinforce state institutions to provide funding and provide uh, the delivery of these essential services in all areas. Well, this is all for me. Many thanks, and we hopefully will have a fantastic conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Esteban Castro. And um, I think that to resonate with what uh, you were, your work and also with all the other partners here is that we hope that our work is useful, is impactful, and actually it transcends not just within you know, certain areas. For example, for academics, we do not just wish that we produce academic output, but also the hope that our work is useful for, uh, for the communities, uh, for the governments, and across different organizations. So I would would like to invite the next speaker um, is uh, Rita Fandeka uh, Mibisi, uh, Vice President of Public Services International and Deputy President of DENOSA, the South African Nurses Union. Uh, Public Services International is the global union federation for workers in public services, including those who worked in social services, healthcare, municipal services, central government and public utilities. We are really grateful for the um, uh, participations as well as the collaborations with uh, PSI. So I would like to invite Rita to the stage.
Rita, can you, uh, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me? Uh, my, apology, yes. my apology for not uh, opening my video. We have a load shading here and uh, my video is, is going to be a bit, a bit dark, but thank you very much, Chairperson, for allowing us to, to be part of this conference and to be part of this opening of this conference. Um, indeed, my name is Rita from Rita City from Africa. I'm a vice president of PSI in Africa. Um, we have already alluded at, the, at our responsibility as a, as, a, as a federation, as a global trade union federation. We are representing 30 million voices of workers to UN, ILO, WHO, and other regional and global organization. We defend the we defend trade union union and as well as the workers' rights. We fight for the universal access of quality public services. Our members indeed are in health care. They are also in the local and regional government. They are in the educational sector. They are also in the public administration. In short, we are representing workers that are giving us life. These workers are the workers that are always at the cold face of war, of pandemic, of natural disasters, and they're also victims of crime. They look after our children, they look after our elderly, they also fix, fix roads, they collect waste, they keep lights on, they provide water, and these workers, in most cases, they're undervalued and under-supported. The neoliberal economics, uh, Chairperson, has infiltrated the public debate. I want to thank all the speakers that presented this morning, from this morning. Indeed, we are under siege as trade unions in the public sector. The public debate all over the, the, the world tells us that these workers do not produce value. And yet, <clears throat> my apology, I've already indicated that my, um, we've got a problem with lights. Um, the New York economics has infiltrated the public debate all over the world telling us that these workers do not produce value, yet these workers are producing something that cares about most. The narrative that we hear is that these workers are, li are liability to the society and to the budget of each and every country. Our public, our public services colleagues should be responsive to the public needs. We need a public service that, uh, that is accessible, affordable, and not profit orientated. We therefore call, off, call on all our governments to support a fair distribution of resources to all countries, irrespective of their economic status. I'll make an example with the distribution and accessibility of the COVID-19 vaccine, COVID vaccine. PSI stands for the TRIPS waiver of COVID-19 vaccines. And we would like to be supported at that. They should provide a decent job for women and young people who also are looked at as undervalued uh, in, the, in the labor market. Unions in the public service must seek to strike a balance between rendering a quality public service and protecting the workers' rights in the field of work. We need to find a balance. We need our governments also to be democratic as the speakers were saying this morning, it, the governments should be democratic, honest, loyal, transparent, accountable to their own citizens. 
Public services cannot be privatized. Health, especially water and other services cannot be, cannot be commodities in the market. In Africa, which is my, my continent, we are also told that there's no money for public service. The conditions which the IMF, as well as the World Bank that are giving, given to Africa, make it difficult for us to be able to provide proper quality public services. We have noted that there is freezing of salaries for workers, shortage of staff, shortage of equipment, shortage of medication, et cetera, especially during the pandemic of COVID-19. Yet, they were, Africa is worth more than that in terms of the natural resources. Therefore, we call upon all uh, governments to look at the austerity measures that are crippling the quality of the public services that we are rendering. We also believe that if there will be tax justice, therefore we'll be able to have revenue of rendering, rendering the public services. That is why we PSI is having a campaign in terms of the tax justice that we want all the multi multinational companies to be taxed fairly so that governments can be able to collect revenue. Consumers of the public service are women and girls. Therefore, carrying a plight of women, girls, and vulnerable uh, groups, we believe that shifting the narrative is needed. We also believe that all workers, students, academics, women, and young people should hold hands in hands in order to shift the narrative. We are proud as PSI to be part of this conference. We are looking forward for, to hear more in the next four days, and we really appreciate for this invite. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rita. And I think you are spot on in saying that in order to shift narratives, we, are, we cannot do it alone. And this conference is exactly the testimony that we need a collaboration with everyone. Um, so thank you so much, Rita, for a very strong message. And I think there's much needed to say. So I would like to invite next um, Alana Dave, Director of Urban Transport from International Transport Workers Federation, ITF, is the democratic affiliate-led um, federation recognized as the world's leading transport authority. So I would like to leave the stage to Alana. Uh, thank you very much. Jenny, that was a very generous introduction to the RTF. Um, and thank you so much for involving us as a partner in this conference. And I'm really pleased to be following our counterpart, which is PSI and public services. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an introduction um, to the ITF, um, we are a global union federation in the transport um, industry. Just to give you a sense of our scale, at the moment we have over 700 trade unions affiliated to us um, from all different regions of the world. Um, at the moment we have approximately 150 countries in the ITF and those unions collectively represent 18 million transport workers. Um, although I'm here speaking from urban transport, we represent all transport sectors. So that covers maritime, aviation, road and rail. And our sort of core role is to represent workers globally on work and employment um, issues in the transport sector, both issues that are specific to each of the transport sectors, but also to the transport industry overall. 
but we don't limit ourselves only to the industrial issues. We also see ourselves as the political voice of transport trade unions um, globally, and we represent their interests in different, not only employers' bodies, but also political forums um, like the UN. So in the case of urban transport, we have a very comprehensive policy called the People's Public Transport Policy covering bread and butter industrial issues, but also wider issues related to public transport like ownership, financing, worker control of technology, decent work and gender equality. Which is really why the issues in this conference are so um, relevant to us as an organization and particularly in urban transport. Um, we see ourselves or we see public transport as a essential, vital um, public service. I think all of us would have experienced and recognized the role of public transport during the pandemic. So in that sense, public transport is no different to the water sector or sanitation or um, electricity. An organization like the UN recognizes urban mobility as an enabler of other rights, as a basic service that everyone should have equal access to. As the ITF, we would take that further and say public transport should be recognized as a fundamental human right that everyone has access to. But we also know that this is very far from the reality. Um, millions of people around the world do not have access to mobility, or even if they do have access, they're often too poor to afford um, paying for public transport services. We also know in most parts of the world, public transport is still informal, not just in terms of the service it provides, but also the employment that it creates. So the majority of workers in the world in public transport are in informal um, employment. So for us, given that kind of like just that very general context gives you an idea of why issues around the political economy of urban transport is so vitally important to us, um, both around what jobs are created in the sector but also the bigger issue of what quality um, of work. And as I've said before, we're not only concerned about the bread and butter workplace issues, um, the wider political economy of the public sector is also relevant to us in terms of financing. At the moment, many public transport systems are in a crisis as a result of the pandemic, drops in ridership, so there is a real financial crisis. What are the alternative public financing um, options for public transport? Issues around ownership, and as Vera said earlier, how workers participate in the planning and decision-making about public transport. So the reason, I mean, those are all the reasons why it is brilliant that all of us have been brought together. And particularly now, for those of you who aren't in the UK, you might have heard that there's a very important transport strike taking place um, at the moment, both in London's public transport system and in the wider network of rail. And I think what the strike is demonstrating is how important it is to challenge the dominant narrative around public services, because the unions are facing a massive backlash on that. And even though they're doing really well in um, responding, it's also very clear that unions cannot do that on their own. It requires a collective voice. It requires voices coming from different spaces um, to speak in support of a different model of, of public services. And I think that's so important that we're able to strengthen our collective capacity and power um, to respond to the neoliberal model, um, which has vested, you know, interests, but also to put forward a counter narrative um, on, you know, which presents a different vision of the public sector, of both work, services, and um, and production. 
Um, I think what's also really important, and I think what the strike in the UK is really demonstrating at the moment, and why this space is of interest to us, is that we need to be putting workers' knowledge, workers' experience at the heart of not only shaping the future of work, but also how to reorganize the public sector, what model um, we want, and how to, um, you know, have that vision, develop that vision based on public ownership and democratic control with worker participation. The importance of workers who really understand the systems in which they work and the institutions contributing to that discussion for us is paramount. So just to conclude, I would hope from this conference in terms of outcomes, Firstly, that we have some at the conference horizontal integration of ideas from different sites of knowledge production and struggle. I think it's really important that we overcome the artificial separation between theory and practice and between um, academics and activists. But I think also at the conference and afterwards, um, if we do recognize the unique knowledge of workers, then how do we develop the methods to access that knowledge so that we are giving visibility to the knowledge that they do have, but at the same time, we also empowering workers to act collectively and by so doing to create new knowledge um, as part of a continuous process of building power to shift narratives. So I would say just lastly, what I would really hope as a long-term outcome from this conference, that we can look at developing um, political education programs that can be delivered for different constituencies, but which brings together our collective knowledge, our collective experience and ideas. And by so doing, we involve people in that ongoing conversation and um, yeah, reflection on, on, on many of these issues. I think there's lots of scope for courses, informal, formal, as well as the development of accessible materials um, for the trade union movement and wider social movement. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you, Alana. Um, that's really, really important. I was thinking about the current strike that's been going on. It's the biggest uh, strike in the last a few decades. And uh, we all, I think in the chat and kind of related to discussions earlier that we talk about um, was, you know, how the strike is being interpreted by different media outlets, by different political parties. And uh, it's quite important that we have a collective supporting voices, like you say, so that the public and also other sectors can understand uh, the rationale behind that and how to move forward. So um, now I would like to um, invite Lavian. Um, sorry, I don't want to butcher your name, but Lavinia um, Stanford from the uh, uh, Trans uh, Transnational Institute TNI. So TNI is an international research and advocacy institute committed to building a just, democratic and sustainable planet. Um, for nearly 50 years, TNI has served as a unique nexus between social movements, engaged scholars and policy makers. I think exactly is what we are trying to achieve as well from this conference. So, uh, so TNI is actually a perfect partner uh, for the conference. So now I would like to invite uh, Lavinia. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, yeah. Um... Thanks uh, again, thanks a million for organizing this really incredibly urgent conference and involving TNI in this effort. Um, so just very briefly before I start, I'm presenting, representing TNI today as uh, my dear colleague that many of you know, Satoko Kishimoto, who started TNI's public service work almost 20 years ago, achieved the impossible by winning the elections and becoming the mayor of Suginami City, a district of Tokyo. So at the final plenary on Thursday, she will tell us all about our campaign, Victory and Plans. Um, so that's just so uh, to explain why, why I am now sharing this. Um, 
after many books and reports like Our Public Water Future, Reclaiming Public Services and the Future's Public, uh, T and I, together with the University of Glasgow, started developing the online and interactive database publicfutures.org a few years back. Um, now it has over 1,500 uh, reclaimed and new public service cases um, and the amazing examples from the PSIRU report, uh, Changing Narratives, will soon be uploaded there too. And it's, it's open for all your um, cases that you might be involved in or know of. Um, then we have been developing um, public community collaborations as a research framework and a real world practice to understand how public services can be effectively democratized complementing representative democracy with more direct forms of community control and participation so that users as well as workers have real decision-making powers to shape and improve public services in line with their needs and capacities. Um, similar to the school management committees in Delhi that David Hall was talking about earlier. Um, now we're uh, working hard to develop and expand the arguments around public energy. On the one hand, TNI is working with the European Network of Multinational Observatories, ENCO, to gather hard evidence showing how green private and multinational energy corporations are fundamentally undermining climate commitments. So public ownership is really the only way out of this mess. At the same time, we have to push for a more expansive I'm sorry for the noise, um, expansive and radical meaning of what public ownership is about by connecting to narratives and demands around ecofeminism, decolonization and indigenous people's justice to make sure that public energy becomes a framework to reverse these structural exploitations. And the narrative lessons that can come from, that will come from this project and conference will be very much uh, centered in this, in this work, in how we communicate and so on. So, Public service spending and provision is, is super important to TNI because it allows us to not only explo expose the capitalist logic of profits no matter what, as privatization of essential provisioning is harmful and killing many, um, but also to show how tax resource accessible quality public services are um, possible um, and beyond the possible, they are viable alternatives that have been happening all around the world. So. Just some background kind of to, to paint the picture. In response to the pandemic, austerity has been relentlessly haunting pop populations in the global south. And sooner or later, this will come back to global north. Digitalization of healthcare, education, and even public administration is leading to new, ever more complex forms of privatization. Free markets that enable TNCs to raise their prices are facilitating inflation and worsening a food and energy crisis and maybe even more explicitly uh, creating this. And with states and corporate authoritarianism becoming more common policy and practice, PSSP as strategies to transform scarcity, competition, privatization into collaborative public abundance, according to need and ability are more important strategies than ever to turn this tide. And I hope and, and I'm very sure that the Shifting Narrative Conference will give us the tools and exchanges to strengthen our narratives and alliances, to become sharper in the stories we tell, to join forces with other social movements and to finally turn this into a truly global um, and sustained campaign. As I was sharing in the PSIRU workshop, with ever more and pressing crisis ahead, we need to connect all these country and sector specific campaigns with real big organizing to transform political discourse worldwide. Um, so for centuries and until this very day, racialized and gendered working people have been systemically thrown under the bus for the benefit of private profits with the unfolding climate catastrophe as the deadly result for, for all, um, but not in equal ways, of course. So we're in dire need of popular stories that can express this in massively mobilizing ways. Um, and again, an international campaign that is on the offensive to call for global public goods, universal basic services or the like would be a most urgent efforts to enforce the kind of reparations to reverse this exploitation. So um, core to this is, is really winning people's hearts and minds with how essential provisioning is common fight and really possible everywhere, that these are human rights, uh, that these are universal human rights to be protected and advanced. Um, though for this, for such a 
campaign to become bigger and more global and more effective, um, we need to work together with many others than we are already are doing. So let's reach out to the many other movements in their own right. Um, to be explicit, the feminist, the abolitionist, the environmental, the indigenous, the migrant and disabilities justice movements to make sure that a slogan like the future is public is a just and unifying response that allows for the many different perspectives, many different struggles and many different stories to finally go viral. Um, and this is what the Future is Public Conference in Chile on 29 November to 2 December will hopefully contribute to. Um, you're almost warmly invited to join us in organizing um, and furthering this international movement around public services that are firmly rooted in feminism, climate justice and global democracy. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Lavinius, and I, uh... Can you hear me now? Sorry, I just want to, yeah. So um, I would like to say that uh, you can see in the chat that people cannot be happier, you know, for uh, the success of Satokos. And we hope that, you know, if the conference would be organized again in the next years, we'll be able to hear more from Satoko and the team of how she reform and, you know, embrace the public services um, and how she changed the narratives within her own district. And uh, also we would love to share more information about the future is public conference coming up in Chile in November. So uh, for now, I would like to invite um, another partner that we really appreciate the participations and the collaboration is from Oxfam International. Um, I would like to invite Katie Maluf Bose for a senior policy advisor from Oxfam. And um, I hope that we, uh, we hear the name of Oxfam, we know that Oxfam is actually is a global movement of people who are fighting for inequality uh, to end poverty and injustice. And Oxfam has a strong commitment to the universal, sorry, universality of human rights. And they've done a lot of amazing work, works around the world. And we hope to hear from Katie why you're interested in this conference and what you do to shift narratives within your work. The floor is yours, Katie. Sure, and thank you so much uh, for inviting us to participate as co-sponsors of this conference. Um, again, I'm Katie Malouf Booth, and I um, lead Oxfam's engagement with the international financial institutions related to public services, most specifically education and healthcare. Um, many of you probably already know Oxfam well. We're an international NGO working in over 90 countries on um, the issues of poverty and inequality in particular, with thousands of partner organizations in, in many different countries looking at sort of longer term development programs, also humanitarian response programs, and then where I focus more on the advocacy and campaigning side. Um, our work on public services has had a uh, a large focus on advocacy and campaigning in support of free, universal, and good quality public services, especially public and education and health, where we have more sort of capacity and, and expertise. Um, and as, as some of the most powerful tools we have to fight extreme inequality and extreme poverty. Um, so we've focused this work on, on both confronting challenges and threats to strong publicly financed and publicly provided services threats such as privatization, a lack of financing and austerity. And then we've also kind of on the other side, really focused on promoting a vision of, of what those free universal good quality public services can look like. We've focused our advocacy efforts, both at the global level in terms of influencing the policies and practices of global institutions like the World Bank Group and the IMF and global funding mechanisms and donors but also on influencing national governments and also local governments in locations where we have country programs and partners um, working on these issues. So for us, this has been decades long work. It's long-term work, but in the context of COVID, um, it's, we really see it as more important than ever. COVID has really shown us the failures of our global system in general, and specifically our, our systems of service provision um, at all the different levels systems that are too often privatized, underfunded, undermined by private corporate interests that are being prioritized over the global public good, as we've all been discussing today. On education, we've seen um, this system of low fee private schools basically falling apart with schools closing their doors permanently during the pandemic or stopping paying their teachers 
failing children and their families. We've seen commercial private health facilities um, hiking their fees and denying people access to care. We've seen a massive situation of vaccine apartheid where people in lower income countries have been denied the access to vaccine technologies that many of us in wealthier countries have been able to enjoy. And we're seeing countries being forced to cut their budgets for education, health, and other public services because of the economic impacts of the pandemic and the crisis, because of high levels of debt servicing, and because of austerity conditions that have been imposed by the IMF, for example. So our work will continue to monitor and expose and confront these forces that are undermining strong public services, especially these harmful trends of privatization and commercialization, as well as sort of making those connections to the austerity measures and the budget um, constraints that are threatening to, to cause large scale um, cuts to public spending. At the same time though, I think we are really optimistic that there are new opportunities that have been created by the COVID area to the COVID era to um, to have some change to see, um, you know, movement in supporting stronger, um, more universal public services. There's a heightened awareness in publics across the world of the importance of public health and education, water, social protection, um, and other services, and also importantly of the crucial role of the state in guaranteeing protecting and delivering these services. We're also seeing a growing understanding of the interconnectedness of people's well-being and the collective risks of these extreme inequalities and in access to services, both within countries and also between countries. Um, so we also are excited about this work in terms of uh, sort of changing the terms of the debate, this narrative change work, um, where we're promoting this new vision of a human economy um, in response to the COVID crisis, which is a, sort of a more equal economic and social system that's resilient in times of crisis, that's based on fulfilling people's rights, starting with transformative universal public services. So, and in doing that, hopefully amplifying the successes that, that are out there of government responses and local and community responses um, to show that this is a world that is possible, kind of drawing on some of the progressive steps that have been taken by governments in, in different parts of the world in response to COVID. So that work is also happening in our work with the international financial institutions in global fora such as Davos and in countries where we're working. So I think we're really excited about this conference and our hope that it will be a space for inspiration, for sharing ideas and learning not only about the latest research, but also effective campaign strategies, including from sectors and areas where we've done less work directly. So sort of this cross fertilization of ideas and strategies um, is really exciting and important. Um, and I really feel like we can learn so much from each other. Um, and so for that reason, um, seeing civil society organizations, trade unions come together with academics to brainstorm solutions, I think is one of the most valuable things about this, this conference. So we're really excited um, about the rich discussions coming up over the next few days. And thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you, Katie. So uh, we we all think that you know from this conference that uh, everybody could actually learn something that's applicable for their own work, for their own organizations, or maybe you know we all realize that it's always better to uh, to actually share the knowledge and share the experience. Um, and you know the beauty of having an online conference that we will be able to gather so many people from so many different countries and, and across different organizations together. So the the conference um, is actually is funded and sponsored by the Open Society Foundations, and we are really grateful for the understanding of the foundation uh, to make this happen. And I would like to invite Professor Laura Cavajo, is a leading Brazilian progressive economist who is the first global director of equity heading the foundation's work to address broad range of structural and economic inequalities. We're familiar with uh, Professor Laura Cavallo's work um, at INET, actually is also a part of, and uh, I would like to uh, leave the stage to uh, Professor Laura Cavallo to share um, the roles of our staff, your work, and uh, what you expect to hear from the four days of the conference. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, it is a pleasure to meet some of you 
um, and uh, see some of the others that I already know. Um, so uh, as you mentioned, I'm stepping in as a global director as director of equity at global programs at OSF, coming from academia, and uh, I'm now on leave from my um, associate professor of economics role at the University of Sao Paulo, which is a major public university in Brazil. Um, and well, as you probably know, OSF has focused on uh, working to build vibrant and inclusive democracies around the world whose governments are accountable. And I think as we saw the rise in far right authoritarianism uh, and other forms of authoritarianism in the past decades, it became clear that inequality has a very crucial role to play both as a cause and as a consequence of uh, the deterioration of democratic institutions. Um, and, and by recognizing that, I think the equity division and, and unit of global programs is really focused on tackling inequalities in its various dimensions and forms. Um, uh, we understand public service as a crucial dimension uh, for that. We see uh, conflict over public services uh, as one of the, the, the causes, for instance, for uh, the, the rise in nativist and other forms of um, far-right um, um, authoritarianism, we see um, uh, inequality more general uh, in terms of access to public services as also being uh, the cause for uh, a lot of public distrust in the state and, and, and in democratic institutions that are um, also strengthening some of these uh, authoritarian discourses. So within global programs, we're now starting to design the strategy for the next few years. Um, one big piece of that strategy is to advance green and inclusive, equitable economic policies around the world. Uh, the way uh, global programs is working is of course, we support the regions in uh, providing, for instance, economic advice and linking governments in the regions who are willing to implement those policies to global experts and practitioners and um, uh, uh, who are um, in different parts of the world and in particularly in the, in the global south. Uh, but we also have a big piece of our strategy that is around uh, supporting a compelling global narrative of a green, inclusive and equitable economic policy agenda. Uh, and there, uh, of course, uh, we, we see uh, uh, the support to progressive policy ideas and uh, innovative models uh, through strengthening networks of thinkers as crucial and essential, which is uh, partly what this conference is, is doing, both through research and convenings like this one. Uh, we also uh, think that uh, strengthening and connecting marginalized voices, especially in the global South, um, uh, to promote this new social and economic policy agendas, and in particular, the means to raise revenues to finance these agendas is essential. And, and here I just want to stress that I think one of the risks and the biggest risks that this moment and this con a global context poses to us is that, of course, in, even if we do have the pandemic and the COVID-19 crisis as maybe making more visible to society uh, the, importance, the importance of uh, universal public services and quality services and the costs of inequality. Uh, we also have this other part that is now, I think, made even more dramatic with the Ukraine crisis, energy prices, inflation around the world uh, that is basically giving uh, I mean, mounting debt in developing countries and the risk of default, and many of these countries are in the verge of defaulting, will create uh, a scenario in which um, new austerity programs and new austerity measures may be implemented. And in those scenarios, as we know, uh, the sector specific demands sometimes end up competing for shrinking budgets 
And it is really important in those scenarios that we build these connections and a cohesive view and integrated view, um, uh, both between activists and social movements and labor movements and academics around the need to uh, also advocate for better funding for the state, for new uh, terms of uh, in the international financial architecture that would allow to finance uh, those better public services so that we're all really united uh, in, in, in uh, changing um, uh, economic policy and countering those, those narratives. Um, we uh, have provided direct support at OSF to many partners who are here this week. And uh, I think uh, as I step into the new role, I, um, I will be happy to, to meet many of you um, uh, moving forward and, and discussing this strategy. Uh, we expect that this conference uh, really engages um, social activists and academia around the world and across sectors in um, new forms of collaboration, building new relationships, um, demanding for future events and conferences and other ways of uh, putting forward this agenda. Um, we also hope that uh, and, and are sure that generation that this, this conference will generate knowledge and new knowledge and narrative on public services, which is really a, a, a very important part of guaranteeing uh, and pushing governments towards implementing those policies, but also um, building uh, public support uh, for for these policies, um, uh, and and we we do think that this is a, a big part of OSF's um, value add uh, to really support um, uh, the these cross sectional alliances and 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 how they can um, deepen advocacy for for green, inclusive, and equitable. Uh, social and economic policy agendas. So um, I would like uh, to, I, I, I'm sure this will be a great conference and I will, I will follow several of the workshops. Um, and uh, on behalf of more than a dozen colleagues of, at OSF uh, and across our network, we look forward to engaging with everyone this week. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Laura. And uh, we also um, would, sorry. Um, so yeah, so basically what I realize is that we are just a few minutes past what, uh, the, what we kind of initially um, expect to be the end of the very first day. But I think it's quite important to hear from another partner of this conference. It's also a very special segment of this conference. It actually is a session dedicated to the young scholars uh, and activists. Um, the session is supported and sponsored by the Young Scholars Initiative of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And uh, Young Scholar Initiative, or YSI in short, is a community of nearly 19,000 students, young professionals, researchers across the world, pursuing new and critical ways of thinking about the economy. I have been a part of I have been part of the YSI for many years now, uh, and I'm so happy that YSI has been a great partner of not only uh, of UCIPP of this conference but also of many other um, events around the world that would gather the young scholars and activists uh, together. And I would like to invite Dr. Serbi Kesa. Uh, to speak about uh, the workshops on the wire side that would be happening on the day four and uh, on what we aim to achieve via uh, this collaboration. Serbi? Thanks a lot, uh, Jenny. Am I audible? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I think uh, since we're at the end of the uh, session, I won't take much time, but kind of just follow up on two of the points that were raised by the speakers earlier and connected to what we plan to do in the sessions with the young scholars here. So, uh, you know, there's a question about, is there something particularly distinct about this conjuncture that we are in? Because, you know, there have been times of crisis over and over again through various centuries, and particularly in the years uh, of, uh, you know, capitalism, global capitalism that we've been in. 
the particular aspect of this conjuncture, I, I believe, is also that there's lack of a direction of some sorts, of lack of where, are, where is it that we are heading in terms of a resolution of the issues that we are facing right now. The old neoliberal order, and you know, we've been having conversations about this throughout the morning, that there's a lack of hegemony in terms of having a stable reproduction of the economic system. And various fissures are appearing, be it in terms of, you know, we already spoke about the strikes, be in terms of the work relations, lack of social security, rise of political right wing, and a lot, lack of resolution even by the liberal governments that existed in various parts of the uh, world. So for Global South particularly, you know, Global North was always an image that it was expected to realize. But we are at a point where Global South economies have uh, clearly not been able to realize that image. In fact, now even for Global North, the image that was presented as the imaginary that everybody was uh, supposed to realize is increasingly becoming undone, partic particularly with huge inequality, lack of labor rights, social security, high productivity wage difference, and so on and so forth. So then I think we're confronted with this very important question. Do we go back to the old models that probably existed both for Global South and Global North? And the answer probably is not that easy, even though there are very con several contesting views of it. One way to deal with it has been, you know, a reinvention of state and uh, sort of including state in particularly important ways. But I think it's important to realize that it was the earlier structures that themselves lend themselves to the neoliberal order that came into being. And therefore, it's also important to think innovatively at this point, what is it that we're going to do? Increasingly, even when state is becoming a part of or coming back in, I don't think it's coming back in a big, big way, but to whatever extent it is coming back, even with, let's say, uh, interventions in terms of basic incomes or basic employment, so on and so forth, it is becoming more in terms of a governance of the poor and the management of the poverty rather than in a big way bringing about the structural change. So I think in what form we want the state to make a comeback and because there is a change in the character of the state itself, which lends itself to the way global capitalism is aligned. So therefore it becomes important to think about when we're talking about these public private par partnerships and we're thinking about the role of the state, how exactly can state's character itself be changed for it to lend itself to a democratic functioning and representing people's rights. So in that context, I want to place the discussion that we'll be having in uh, the coming days with the Young Scholars Initiative, because uh, Young Scholars Initiative, which is a part of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, came into being after the 2008 economic crisis. And the idea was to think outside the box about innovative ways and fresh economic thinking, which is not just carrying the old dogma. And now, the COVID crisis has come in the backdrop of that 2008 crisis, where we still kind of caught in this sort of an interregnum, to use Antonio Gramsci's words, where the old is dying and the new cannot be born. So in what directions can we really push it? And there, I think the whole idea of narratives, which is a much broader conception than just academics writing their papers and their silos, but rather about an engagement and building new ways of thinking with activists, with young scholars. And in that, the Young Scholars Initiative kind of provides a space for students, for young scholars to come and really radically think about these ideas. And the narratives conference in that context is providing another such space of engagement where there is a possibility where everybody who's coming together is coming from very different spaces of engagement to bring together and to think very freshly about the questions that have been raised. So uh, thanks a lot for involving Young Scholars Initiative in this uh, program. And Jenny, who's been my mentor in uh, YSI, I'm really glad to be involved in the YSI organizing here with you. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Serbi. And I would like to say that uh, it's always wonderful to have uh, Serbi or co-organizing a lot of YSI events uh, in so many different uh, parts of the world. And thank you so much to all the speakers today. And I believe that uh, we hear, what we hear from them is that at the moment we're all 
very stimu highly stimulated and you know uh, and, and motivated to continue our discussions in the next days and we will all have the same aim that we will learn from each other that we will be able to uh, hopefully from this conference find uh, the good way and you know a progressive way for that will be helpful for our work but also to change the narrative to shift the narrative so that we have a universal or we, we actually can improve the services also may be able to provide universal access to services improve uh, government spending and production so uh, I just want to say roughly about tomorrow and we hope as organizers we will be sending out emails uh, reminder emails to you all and all the register uh, registrants of the conference about tomorrow we will have three concurrent themes tomorrow and uh, for each theme you will have one zoom link that you can actually join you can actually join and then leave and then rejoin so that's the beauty of the freedom of this conference uh, you are um, you are welcome to join as many uh, sessions as possible. So the first session is going to start at 9 a.m. BST, the British Summer Time, and uh, the final session is going to end roughly about 5 p.m. the British Summer Time. So I would like to um, for you to actually be able to reflect on today's uh, discussions, and I will hopefully see you tomorrow in the conference. Thank you so much for your contribution and thank you for attending and participating in the discussion so far. Thank you, have a good day, bye. Thank you all my friends.